Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're incredibly excited to have this important conversation um, about why we need nature now and what that has to do with investing. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Ahmed Borg. I'm the CEO of the Global Impact Investing Network. I'm very honored uh, to, to moderate this panel. Um, we have a wonderful panel here representing a variety of perspectives on an incredibly important topic. Um, I'll give a very brief intro to our panelists um, and set the stage a bit for the conversation before bringing Charlotte in to give some framing comments and we'll dive into the discussion. Um, but first, um, our, um, our panelists, we have a, a lot of wonderful perspectives that represent very different vantage points on this conversation about the role of of nature and how it connects to investing. Um, first, we have Charlotte Kaiser, uh, who's Managing Director of the NatureVest Impact Investing Team, uh, which is part of the Nature Conservancy, um, a very well-known uh, global environmental nonprofit that has more than 4,000 employees. Um, NatureVest has helped to structure and close 12 transactions to date, uh, and that represents about $1.3 billion of committed capital. We also have Eugenie Matthew, uh, who's a senior impact analyst and um, Earth Pillar lead at Aviva Investors, which is a, an insurance company um, and also um, a, a, sorry, a global asset manager that's part of an insurance company. Uh, Aviva Investors manages uh, nearly $500 billion in assets, um, and it's part of the UK's largest insurance company. Uh, last but not least, we have Oliver Withers, who is the biodiversity lead within the sustainability strategy, advisory, and finance group at Credit Suisse. Um, he works to integrate biodiversity considerations into the firm's business activities and decision making. Now, as we um, approach this conversation and, and before we hear from the panelists, I did want to just give a couple of remarks about how important this conversation is um, on, on a few different levels. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in the environment. Um, and when it comes to investing, um, there's growing momentum around the need to focus on environmental considerations and environmental impact. Uh, however, much of that attention, um, the way many people see the role of the environment when it comes to investing, is starting with a big picture of the environment, um, then boiling down to climate, and then really focusing on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, that's incredibly important, and we don't have enough activity working to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions where we stand today. Um, and it's, it's very critical that we get more investor engagement on that issue, given the nature of the climate crisis that we face. But the climate crisis isn't the only environmental crisis that we're contending with. Um, we also have a crisis of ecological loss um, you know, and, and, um, and, and the loss of nature. Um, and that's something that we're increasingly seeing coverage of in the news um, and, and many people are experiencing viscerally um, in their own communities, whether it's loss of species, damage to the environment more broadly, disruption of ecosystems, um, and all kinds of um, effects and implications of those changes. Um, now, it, it's incredibly important for, for us to address that crisis as well. And I think part of what I hope this conversation could be part of um, is helping to elevate the significance of nature on the radars of investors um, and also help to demonstrate how some leading actors are incorporating biodiversity into their strategies and approaches. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're going uh, to have an incredibly important conversation. And I want to invite Charlotte to just share from her perspective at the Nature Conservancy some of this kind of like broader framing before we dive into the discussion. It's great to be with all of you today. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, and also, candidly, a little bit dismayed that we're the only panel really talking about investing in biodiversity when we consider the depth of the crisis and the the extent of the impact that, that the severe biodiversity loss that we're facing is going to have on our well-being. Um, <clears throat> the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And that includes us. Uh, the, the ecological systems which represent the natural capital that we're going to talk about today um, are really what's required for, for thriving life on Earth, including thriving human life. And we learned this year Right, the impact that nature can have on, on human well-being um, through zoonotic pandemics and the, the advent of the novel coronavirus, um, which has transformed how we live. We learned this year how interconnected all of us are um, uh, through nature um, because of that pandemic. And we learned this year uh, that, that the economics of our, of our life can transform in an instant because of a natural phenomenon. 
And so I think, you know, this conversation has never been more urgent or more critical. And while it's definitely the case that um, we need all hands on deck in this crisis and the investment community is only one player on the field, uh, it's a very powerful and important one. Uh, and I know that my colleagues, Oliver and Eugenie, have a lot of really important insights into how they as investors are transforming their work uh, and, and how and we at Nature Investor are working across the investor spectrum to help others do the same. So thanks for being here, everyone. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. And I want to um, you know, really start with uh, that focus on the you know, kind of the role of investors. Um, and, you know, and just to level set, I think we have some people in the audience who do a lot of work around biodiversity. I think we also have some who are coming here to learn. So it's just to help set the stage, um, you know, I'd love to hear um, each of you just talk a little bit about um, like how, um, why investors should care about biodiversity. You know, um, and, but from both sides of the equation, how does it um, pose risks to investors? Um, but also where are their opportunities? Um, and, and Charlotte, if you could start, um, then I'll work my way around the group, but um, you know, we'd love to hear kind of how you see this as an investment strategy and why you see other investors um, you know, caring about these issues. Yeah, that's exactly the frame we think about this, Ahmed. It's a, it, it, not thinking about biodiversity creates a lot of risk and thinking about it creates a lot of opportunity. Um, there's a group Planet Tracker that does a lot of research around kind of natural capital and economics. And um, I was speaking to one of the partners there a while ago, and they were doing some research into the uh, the the percentage of sovereign GDP that rely on natural capital. And the the example that the partner shared with me is Argentina, which doesn't hold a lot of foreign currency reserves, issues a lot of sovereign debt, um, and and doesn't hold those reserves because of the the kind of huge influx of dollars that comes into the country every year from key industries like tourism, wine, and beef. If you think for a second about the natural capital underpinning those three sectors, um, you quickly realize that there's a huge amount of risk associated with um, Argentine sovereign debt, and I'm not just picking on Argentina, but it's just a good clean example, um, around those natural systems and, and the absence of safeguards protecting them uh, really really creates risk that, that investors need to be underwriting a little bit more thoughtfully. On the opportunity side, there's we've we've done a lot of work in, in forest management with our Cumberland Forest Project, and we've recently launched a collaboration with BTG Pactual's Timberland Investment Group, kind of amplifying that work. Managing forests for biodiversity impacts um, and climate resilience really helps to drive a more resilient asset base um, that can create a lot of co-benefits that have some, in some cases, have revenues associated with them. And in other cases, really just underpin a much more resilient local economy. Um, for example, managing for outdoor recreation starts to diversify the economic um, base of a, of a community out of, out of natural resource extraction, which we're doing in the Cumberlands. Uh, so there's there's both downside mitigation and upside generation uh, available if you're thinking carefully about these assets. Okay, thanks for that, Charlotte. And and I think I'd, I'd also love to hear um, Eugenie how you think about it. You know, working for a global asset manager, um, how is biodiversity factoring into your work? And is it um, you know how do you make the case to investors, whether they're colleagues or external partners, um, about the need and the opportunity? Thanks. Um, I think that the the way we're looking at it um, is the, the the statistics of the place to start. And scientists are now saying we're entering the phase of the sixth great extinction. The last was when the dinosaurs died out. And the WWF data shows that globally we've had a 68% drop in species numbers since 1970. That is just ma massive, 68% drop since 1970. Um, and another expression I've been working on uh, on a project I, I been working on is this, if there's no nature there's no business we can't operate without nature all of um, nature underpins what business does so the risks are existential um the an example and another example on top of argentina that also comes from planet tracker which i think is a, is, is a useful recent one is is brazil and the deforestation is is changing brazil's climate um it's making it drier hotter and less predictable um, Brazil is the number two exporter of soy in the world and number three exporter of maize. And this um, huge output depends on its ability to double crop. So using the same farmland twice in a year and double cropping depends on a stable climate with consistent rainfall and temperature patterns and deforestation is destabilizing that. So um, 
there are another, lots of other examples like the, the Australian um, Great Barrier Reef and the, the, the huge amount of economic contribution that makes the Australian economy every year. Um, but uh, NASA has estimated that the um, coral reefs around Australia will just become non-existent if we have two degrees of warming. And if they just disappear, what will that do to the Australian economy? So the financial risks are, are massive. Um, and as a result of that, we're seeing other shifts which pose you know more imminent um, impacts to business like uh, changing regulation and changing consumer habits and just some examples of some new regulation that's coming through is in the UK we've got new leg new legislation requiring companies to do due diligence to make sure there's no illegal deforestation in their supply chain we've also got a new tax on virgin plastic use in um, packaging so it's going to be comparatively more expensive to use virgin rather than recycled content in plastic um, the EU farm to fork strategy has set targets to um, halve pesticide use and reduce fertilizer use by 20%. And there's increasing regulation, uh, likely the regulation in the US and other countries on uh, PFAS chemicals, hazardous chemicals, the forever chemicals that accumulate in our environment. Um, the Dasgupta review, which is a seminal uh, review in Britain, um, led by the, the, US, the UK government commission, Treasury, um, interestingly, the Treasury and not other departments commissioned a, a report on the biodiversity and the economic um, impacts. And he came up with lots of ideas for, for new um, taxes, for example, a tax on um, people using the oceans for fishing, shipping and uh, cruise ships. And if companies like that are, all companies take advantage of nature to a degree, but some of them, their business model is very dependent on taking advantage of nature and it's a free resource. And if, I think that needs to change. And so we, I think we'll be seeing more in the way of resource taxes and access to nature taxes. Um, so that's obviously um, a risk and an opportunity for business. Um, thirdly, the changing consumer expectations. i just give one example of, of um, meat. And there's been increasing um, recognition in Europe and in America that um, a low uh, reducing our meat consumption is good, not only for human health, but also for the environment. And um, alternative... In, in Britain, um, meat consumption has dropped 17% uh, per capita in the last decade, which is quite a significant drop. And so there, we're seeing huge growth in alternative meat products. And although they only take up 1% of the global meat demand today, they're expected to see 15% growth over the next 10 years to become a 50 billion market by 2030. Um, people will have heard of Beyond Meat, which has seen its revenues grow 12-fold in the last three years. So there are lots of... Um, risks and opportunities for companies. And um, another example of the opportunities is, I always find it amusing that this, these figures weren't produced by a green NGO, but by World Economic Forum, which is behind Davos, and sort of all the, the big cheeses every year in Switzerland. And they've said that um, if we become nature positive, there are three um, sectors where we, critical shifts are needed to become nature positive. Um, and that, that, that if we make these shifts, there'll be $10 trillion worth of business opportunities and 395 million jobs by 2030. And these shifts include ecosystem restoration, more efficient and circular use of resources and densification of the urban environment. So I think we're seeing these sort of big existential risks plus the, the response, which will be the changes in regulation, changes in consumer habits, leading to these great opportunities for business. Mm -hmm. No, thanks for that. I want to come back to some of that um, that compelling data that you cited from the World Economic Forum. Uh, but before I do so, um, you know, Oliver, I'd love to get your take. You know, working at um, a major global bank, um, you know, how do these you know um, biodiversity considerations factor into the operations of the bank, and and how do you see um, you know the case being made to investors that you work with? Yeah, thanks, Emmett. I mean, just to to you know second everything that Charlotte and Eugenie have said. Um, there's that macro uh, risk and the micro risk, and the reality is is that as a as a global bank, uh, we operate across multiple jurisdictions. Biodiversity is is quite strange in that it is it's very distinct according to geographies, which makes uh, standardization quite challenging. But it does mean that we know that certain markets are going to have more exposure than others. Uh, and dependency on biodiversity, uh, and Eugenie, you know, referenced the the overall kind of loss um, in species abundance that we've seen since 1970, and the challenge is is that when we look at at 
particular sub-markets, regions, we, we start picking up that there are unfortunately some cases where 64% would be a best case or a good case, if you will. Um, so I think for us, it's about understanding that the landscape in which we as a, a financial institution operate in is changing. Um, and that means that we need to change with that. And, you know, as much as, as we are doing transactions that are short term in nature, the reality is, is that those transactions are, are driven by our client base and our client base is long term in nature. Um, and so when the, those macro conditions start impacting the micro, i.e. our clients, that's a long-term challenge. And it's not just a long-term challenge for us as a bank, it's a long-term challenge for all of banking, right? So collectively, we all have a responsibility here to, to drive that change that's necessary. But as Charlotte and Eugenie have alluded to, I mean, that's also, you know, generates a lot of opportunity. Um, we're seeing disruptors, right? Uh, innovation come to market where that is attracting capital. And that's really exciting where we're seeing, if you will, environmental entrepreneurs. Um, and we need more of those, quite frankly. Um, but that's another opportunity. And, you know, as a, as a bank that prides itself on backing entrepreneurs, that's an exciting opportunity for us going forward. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we, we all operate in this global economy. And we need both the micro and macro to be stabilized. And I think that's why you see the institutions like the IMF coming out now and recognizing the importance of nature. There is this, this massive role in terms of, of short-term stabilization, uh, but also long-term economic growth. Um, and that's why for us, uh, you know, mainstreaming biodiversity in our decision making is absolutely critical um, and ensuring first and foremost that we are, are accounting for the risks uh, to biodiversity, but also the risks that biodiversity loss creates for our clients and ultimately for us. But, you know, it's a huge opportunity in that this all of our economies need to transition and that transition needs financing and it needs solutions. And ultimately, we're a bank interested in doing transactions and financing that transition. Great, no, and, and I want to, um, you know, uh, I'll come back to you in a moment, Eugenie, about you know to, to um, respond to this, but I want to pick up on some of the themes that we've, we've surfaced already. Uh, so we've talked about macro risk and what this means for the global economy. We've talked about micro risk and, and how um, you know there's specific industries and in, in, in a national or local context that are reliant upon nature. Um, whether it was some of the examples from Argentina that, that Charlotte referenced or some of the examples from Brazil. Um, and we can see this all around the world around sensitivities of agricultural um, and food systems um, you know, to uh, reliance upon nature. Um, so we've talked about the risk side. Um, Eugenie shared some of the opportunity side that was surfaced by um, uh, the, the Nature Positive report coming out of the World Economic Forum. Um, about a um, you know ten trillion dollar opportunity just you know by focusing on three areas, um, uh, certainly a um, conveniently round number, um, but nonetheless um, one thing that certainly gets the attention about the magnitude of opportunity that we're looking at, um, and yet um, we all find that there's not enough attention being paid to this from investors, and and that's kind of how we kicked off. So can we talk a little bit about what's holding investment back? Um, you know, as you engage with you know um, colleagues in your firms or in, in you know external partners, what do you see getting in the way of, of more investment to help um, you know, to be nature positive or to help you know, promote um, biodiversity? I mean, Eugenie, if I, we can start with you. Well, firstly, the slightly negative is that. Um, you know, if you're an investor and you want to look at uh, investment opportunities to restore nature, um, I'm not aware of a um, large scale uh, investment opportunity that generates an income. It's as simple as that. If you want to restore nature, you have to pay to do it. You're not going to get an income back from it. So I think that's going to change in future. I think governments are going to realize that to restore nature, that, that we need to tax the, the activities that are harmful to nature and spend that, reven that tax revenue on, on um, funding the restoration of nature. Um, secondly, if you want to look at companies, um, we've been developing a, a natural capital strategy this year, and we want to. We've, we've got three strands. We're avoiding companies who are doing significant harm, so we're, we're screening out companies that are involved in intensive agriculture uh, over a certain proportion of their their revenues, and also companies that have got certain over a certain proportion of their revenues from pesticides, and companies that got 
um, strong environmental controversies and they've got high involvement in fossil fuels. Um, so first of all, avoiding harm. Secondly, solution revenue. So companies making products or services that are offering solutions to the, the destruction of natural capital. So we're looking at techno technologies and approaches and products like uh, regenerative agriculture, um, water treatment, alternatives to plastic packaging, um, uh, ways to make, uh, to reduce the amount of water used, huge different numbers of technologies, but they're all fairly nascent and they all do provide very small proportions of overall corporate revenue for the big publicly listed companies that we're looking at. Um, and then the third strand is that we look at transition, what we call transitioning companies. So we're trying to identify leaders and potential leaders, uh, companies who are reducing their, doing the most to reduce their impacts and setting ambitious targets and have good, strong biodiversity policies, policies uh, strong zero deforestation policies um, to really focus on reducing their deforestation and their supply chain. Um, but we've had many challenges in developing the strategy. Number one is the lack of data. Um, there is no equivalent of CO2. One fantastic indicator that you can compare all companies. You know, I'm looking to compare 3,000 companies. That's what my, is in my spreadsheet. If I can do that on CO2, I can see who's emitting the most and who's got the strongest targets to reduce those emissions. There is no equivalent indicator for nature. Um, and that's under development. But the problem is, is that we have so many different impacts on water, air, soil, um, land use change, and every sector has different impacts. So if, if it, for me, if I'm trying to compare a bank to a beverage company, um, a bank I'd be looking probably most importantly at its zero deforestation policy, whereas for a beverage company, I'd be looking at where is it sourcing its its ingredients from, what's its packaging reduction policy, um, uh, and its water use. So it's got three completely different impacts from a bank. So you couldn't you couldn't ever really compare them on the same indicators. And now the only real indicators that we have available to us for three thousand companies, even that this is patchy, is water use and amount of waste generated. And I, I would argue that actually <laughs> those are almost irrelevant indicators to compare 3,000 companies on because the water use depends on where you are and the amount of waste generated depends on how, uh, also where you are, how it's disposed of and how toxic it is and various different um, things. So we have a big problem with a lack of data and there's a huge amount of initiatives underway to improve that situation, to um, encourage companies to report better, like the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure um, and the SBTN initiative of science-based targets for nature. So hopefully in two or three years, we're going to see better data coming through for companies, which will enable investors to, to make um, better decisions. Um, and finally, um, in terms of barriers, I think it's also just the, the company's attitude is, is also a really big issue because unlike with fossil fuels, where if you reduce your fossil fuel use, you can save money, if you reduce your impacts on nature, it does generally tend to cost you more. Um, nature is free to destroying it is free in almost all situations. So um, companies are reluctant, obviously, to increase their costs. But luckily, with the changing regulations and changing consumer demand, it's just not going to be acceptable for very much longer to continue the destruction of nature. And we've seen this example with um, the Brazilian meat packing companies, the, 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 the three biggest cattle processing companies in Brazil made a commitment in 2010 to eradicate deforestation from their supply chain by 2020. And they they focused on, they can prove that how much deforestation goes in on their, their, the supplies they buy directly from, that each cow will go through five or six farms before the point it's slaughtered. And the deforestation will occur on those first five farms. It may not occur on the sixth farm, and that's who the company is buying from. So they say, oh, well, you know, we have no deforestation because they don't know where it comes from. And at the moment, they just say, oh, it's too expensive for us to track the cattle through the farms. Um, and even though Uruguay has a system that does it for all cattle, it's too expensive for Brazil because it's bigger and therefore it can't be done. Whereas I think that this is a small example. This will be just become ex the ex standard cost of doing business in the future. That, that, that not knowing the traceability and the origins of your products will not be acceptable in future. And one example I like from my own experience was when I started working with a British um, clothing retailer that's now the biggest clothing retailer in Britain. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago, they had they just started looking at social issues, labour standards in their supply chain. And um, they had employed one person two days a week um, to look at 
finding all the child labour and slave labour and forced labour and all the human rights abuses in 2,000 factories. And we were advising them and said, I think that one person two days a week might not be enough. And they said, well, you don't understand. You know, we couldn't possibly increase the cost of doing business. You know, we sell a T-shirt for five pounds. Where do you think the money is going to come from to, to do all this checking? And now, I think it might be 20 years later, they have 145 people full time working on this. And that's just the employees of the company. And they're still making money. They're still making more money than they've ever made before. And they're also implying, um, employing legions of armies of verifiers and auditors who go to all the factories to check. So I like to think that that parallel will happen um, with traceability of, of high, high impact commodities too. And it will just become integrated into the cost of doing business and what's just generally expected. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for those thoughts tonight. And Charlotte, I'm going to come to you in a moment about this point that Eugenie raised around revenue streams um, you know, connected to restoring nature. Um, but before I do so, Oliver, I'd love to get your take as well. You know, what do you see holding investors back? Why don't we see more capital flowing um, in a nature positive way? Yeah, I mean, listen, let me just start. Uh, the data and regulatory comments from Eugenie are, I, I second, completely huge, huge challenges. Uh, but as she's outlined, um, we are making strides to address those. Uh, it might not be as quick as, as some of us would like, um, but there is progress, uh, and that's really exciting. Um, I think a, a, a practical challenge that we face is, is just that sometimes we forget that, that biodiversity is complex, right? We are, Eugenie alluded to this, we don't have a simple metric. We've got 8 million species plus, we're still finding them. Unfortunately, we're still losing them at a pretty rapid rate, as, as we've discussed already. Um, and a, a kind of challenge that emerges is that with that requires some degree of innovation. And, and that doesn't always fit investors' mandates or buckets, right? And so, you know, ultimately there'll be a fund. What is that fund's mandate? Uh, what is the particular client looking for? Does it tick boxes? And, you know, we forget that in, in many instruments that there's been an opportunity for those instruments to grow over time uh, and, and really evolve over time and for the market to evolve over time with it, right? So if we consider how uh, green bonds, sustainability linked bonds have, have emerged as a force, um, that has taken time. And, you know, we're now taking a topic that's really complex and and trying to to mainstream it and fast track it as quickly as possible um and sometimes that complexity is difficult uh to to do that quickly um also we've got a responsibility here right that um we want this market to be a success this asset class as some people refer to it um that means we can't afford failures if you will um, and I think we're all well aware of, of greenwashing allegations um, and, and the severe risk that presents to the market, not to individual companies, but to the market as well. And, you know, uh, Charlotte rightfully pointed out at the beginning of this, it's great to be in this forum discussing biodiversity, but it's also a bit concerning that this is the only uh, uh, session really focusing in on this, right? Um, so, you know, I do think that complexity makes it difficult to fit with investor mandates sometimes. Um, and so you sometimes need brave investors, right? Um, and we need to applaud those people more as well. I think also we've got to manage expectations. Um, you know, uh, we've alluded to the future possibilities and sizes of the market. But again, it's going to take time to get there. And maybe sometimes in our enthusiasm to, to try and kind of uh, share the Kool-Aid out, um, we can overestimate the, the maturity of the market, um, you know, and you've got to be careful what you wish for, uh, because I think we are at, at somewhat of a turning point in the market. And, you know, serious institutional investors are starting to knock at the door saying we want to discuss biodiversity. Um, and that's what we've all been wanting. Um, now we've, we've got to solve for these uh, discussions, which is really exciting. And then just the final point is that I think uh, this question of legality of natural capital, right? Um, we, we know natural capital provides ecosystem services, it provides climate mitigation and adaptation, and it's creating all of these benefits. Who owns those benefits is not clear in some instances. 
right? Which means that the the cash flows that those those services generate, it's not always clear who who should be the beneficiary of those. And I think it's really really important. I go back to this this comment I had earlier around the geographic nature of of biodiversity in nature. We have to acknowledge local communities in many instances have rights to to that natural capital as well. And so as much as we look for cookie cutter approaches, sometimes those, those aren't the solutions that we look for. Um, and so how do we solve for that legality question? And you know, it raises this big question for me, where is the, the balance sheet of natural capital? Um, and that's why the, you know, the work that Charlotte and, and TNC do around uh, the debt swaps for sovereigns is so important because it creates an overarching framework um, under which we as corporates and our clients all have to operate. Um, so, you know, that legality and that sovereign ownership uh, is a challenge, but thankfully we, we are with these solutions and we're starting to see them deployed. Yeah. Yeah, that, that resonates. And I think one thing I um, uh, you hear loud and clear, uh, the desire to have this issue kind of highlighted more um, at this venue. I, I think one um, thing I did want to share um, is that one of the few trips I've made since we've you know, been you know, living with the pandemic um, was actually just a few weeks ago to Singapore to attend an event and, and, and to speak at an event um, hosted by Tomasa called Ecosperity. Um, it was a three-day event and they had a whole day um, focused on nature. Um, and so one, one, one was focused on climate action, one was nature, and then one you know, more broadly on sustainable finance. So I, I just share that only to underscore the fact that this is I, you know, I think you know, maybe unevenly, but this is starting to kind of rise on the agenda of you know um, investors and financiers who are trying to think about you know how to invest in a sustainable world. Um, but I, and I also do think that it kind of underscores one of the things that's been raised here that you know for many communities um, they're recognizing that their economies are very reliant um, upon nature, um, and so if they don't start to address this crisis. Um, it'll have profound effects on broader economic stability um, beyond just what we directly associate with um, the kind of parks and forests and other things that we all enjoy. Um, but you know, there, there's this question, of course, and you know, investment needs a revenue um, you know, model and a business model. And and I think um, I want to ask you, Charlotte, about kind of where do you see um, you know to this point about like you know, are there revenue models associated with restoring nature? Kind of how do you design things that allow this to be investable? Yeah, it's a great question, and I, I'm I'm seeing a comment in the chat uh, too from I lost it um, uh, about that. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I fundamentally, Eugenie's right. There, there isn't nobody's going to pay you to kind of not cut down trees. At the same time, you know, and this is the role the Nature Conservancy and Nature Vest are playing in our kind of conservation advisory work with partners like BTG and and Renewable Resources Group is. There are ways of doing business that um, can deliver biodiversity outcomes in a way that where where <clears throat> financial returns are uh, either enhanced or not impacted. Um, one of the thing, one of the deals we've done in at Nature Vest is within the Murray Darling Basin in Australia, where we are buying and selling water rights, but also um, in years of, of greater water abundance being a buyer for nature and delivering water back into wetlands that would otherwise not be receiving them because of the engineered nature of the um, watershed there at this point. And so we're we're basically addressing a market failure where there is no buyer for nature, but there is sufficient water in the system in these, in these kind of hydrological boom years to really significantly impact wetlands for the good. Uh, so it's, it's interventions like that that require some scientific and technical expertise um, which the Nature Conservancy is able to provide. And, and I'm, Eugenie, your story of the, the company that's um, gone from two to 150 staff thinking about, um, you know, work conditions. I'd like a future where every limited partner is asking a fund manager, who's your conservation advisor ensuring biodiversity impacts? Um, because that, you know, I think there's a real role for that because I, to your point, Oliver, the complexity uh, really can scare investors away and even the bravest of investors are stymied um, by by figuring out how to how to price biodiversity risk and value biodiversity returns um, you know more more directly right 
managing fisheries well, managing forests well, managing other forms of kind of working natural capital well improves their their uh, health and therefore increases their value. Right? It's a it's a long term versus a short term perspective, um, which I think again, you know, partners like the Nature Conservancy can help investors uh, deliver. But we do, to Oliver's point, really need more brave investors. I think one of the other things that's really holding investors back is the novelty of, of the kinds of structures that are required for this work mm-hmm. and the change. You know, the, the thinking that got us here is not going to get us out of here. And, and mm-hmm. investors definitionally don't like novelty and impact definitionally requires it. Um, and Ahmed, I know no one believes this more than you. Uh, and so that's a piece that I, I'm really, you know, asking investors to lean in on and, and to all of this work be great about. Yeah. Can I, um, can I clarify yeah, what, what, I, what I meant before? I'm, I'm, I meant that there's no income stream from restoration projects. There's definitely uh, income to be gained from green companies that are reducing their impacts on nature, so sustainable forestry. But I meant actual active restoration. So tree planting when you're not cutting them down and restoring right. wetlands and restoring peatlands. Um, that's what I was referring to. And also for a large investor like us who invests quite a large m- amount of money and we don't really do venture capital size investments. We're looking for big, you know, mainly public companies. So that's what I meant. Mm-hmm. No, thanks. Thanks Makes for the clarification. Yeah, and, and just building on this point that, that Charlotte raised and, and it, you know, Oliver spoke to this as well about, you know, investors want to see things that they understand. I, you know, I am, um, uh, we, we have at the gin we have over 350 firms that are members they include folks like like the nature conservancy um, as well as huge global institutions like credit suisse and and um, insurance companies pension funds and others um, I remember a panel um, back when we had in-person panels um, that we have a, um, one the CIO of one of our members is you know, it's a big global insurance company you manage several hundred billions of dollars. Um, and very interested in like committed impact investing. They've moved several billion dollars into it. And the CIO is very clear. He was like, I like fourth and fifth time funds. You know, he was like, I'm not looking for the new innovative thing. He's like, I just like things. He, he was like, and he's like nothing against them. He's like, that's just what we can process. And, you know, he's like, so we're looking for opportunities that are that mature. Um, obviously that is, um, you know, a lot of these strategies, if they're more innovative models that require kind of departures from conventional structures, um, we need folks like him and others to be, you know, open to and thinking about, you know, different ways of, of deploying capital. Um, and that brings me to my last question that will kind of go around. We we um, are running out of time um, quickly, and so I'm keeping an eye on, um, on, on, you know, how we can bring this to a close while covering such a, um, you know, so much content, so much kind of territory. But this question of like, you know, what's needed to scale? Like, where do you see opportunities and, and what would it, you know, take to get us from where we are today um, to where we need to be, and and the one one of the good kind of glimmers of hope that I see, um, as I you know, engage with our global network, um, is I actually see this coming up on the radars of a lot more investors than we're talking about even just a year ago. Um, many of our members that focus on financial inclusion or focus on like you know, climate strategies are now talking about the need to do more around nature based solutions or nat- natural capital strategies, and you know there's various terms that are coming up, um, but I think it's a positive sign. And so I think the moment upon us is to figure out how do we channel that interest and momentum um, in, into more activity. Um, so tall order, um, but I think a good note for us to finish on, um, and we'll we'll go quickly around the virtual room. Um, Eugenia, if you could start and talk a little bit about where do you see the opportunities and what, what do you think is essential to, to getting more scale? I, th- I think um, the companies who are doing exciting things in this area with exciting products and services will see huge growth, just like we've seen in renewable energy companies. And that will be that will speak for itself. People will be drawn towards it. And um, so that will be one thing. I think we'll see um, great momentum coming out of initiatives like the TC, TC, TNFD and the SBTN. <laughs> um, that will catalyze action. We've got the Kunming Conference next year, which will draw attention to this whole issue. Um, and... I'm hoping that there will be more attention paid <laughs> to uh-huh. this, the, this concept of taxing uh, resource use and that, so that the use of nature, the destruction of nature is no longer free and that we see um, things like red meat and, 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 and the oceans and use of free resources, um, that the, the economic model has changed so that um, that is what's taxed and not actual employment or uh, uh-huh. other public goods. Um, so that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, thank you. 
And Oliver, um, from your perspective, kind of where are you seeing client demand and what do you think is needed to, to scale? I mean, listen, I think at the, the client demand at the moment is pretty broad, right? Yeah, you've got some, some, some players that have got very niche requirements, but that's driven by their personal connections to nature very often, right? Um, I think that the, the exciting prospect on the horizon is that when we look at, uh, at the regulatory environment in improving uh, to the benefit of nature, uh, that's going to increase the valuation of nature. And you know, the reality is, is that if we can look at companies that aren't necessarily generating a profit and we can put a value on their equity for their future profits, we can start having similar thoughts and discussions around the future value of, of biodiversity, right? Uh, and I think that that opens up a, a really interesting conversation around how do we start valuing biodiversity today? Uh, acknowledging that we might actually only be able to extract the value from it in the future, uh, just like a lot of companies do. Um, so that, for me, is the, one of the really exciting prospects. Okay, thank you. And, and Charlotte, you'll get the um, uh, the final word. <laughs> At least in the panel, I'll say a couple things to close out. But but I know you work on this issue all the time, um, and it's part of your mandate at, at, at NatureVest. Um, what do you think is needed to scale? I think we're getting there. I just worry it's not fast enough. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the examples that we've been able to develop uh, in, our, in our ocean financing sec, you know, team, in our, in our partnership with Renewable Resources Group and our collaboration with BTG, we're showing that you know, capital can be deployed at scale in the hundreds of millions of dollars in ways that really deliver benefits for nature that are measurable and meaningful. Uh, what we need now is for everybody to kind of do the same. Um, and I think it's going to be a combination, as Eugenie said, of, of this is the winning strategy. I mean, that I think is the main takeaway that all of us mm -hmm. feel, right, for, for this panel is get on the train because it's leaving the station and you're going to be stuck behind in a sort of desolate world otherwise. And so this is the winning strategy and it's really on us um, in our role to create examples and pathways for investors uh, and for the entrepreneurs uh, and the clients to, to offer those opportunities as well. Great, thank you. Well, and you, um, you brought up this topic too that we didn't really get, get um, into, but around measurement. Um, and it came up early in the conversation. Um, it's a huge topic, and I did want to just let folks know that um, the impact measurement and management systems between supports just launched some initial strategies on biodiversity. Um, I'll, I'll put the link in the, the chat if you, um, if you want to check it out, but it's um, open to public comment and we'd love feedback and, and um, your thoughts. Um, but that, that is another big topic that's really important in this conversation. Um, as we close this out, though, um, I, I do want to thank our panelists for sharing their perspective. This is an incredibly important topic. Um, I think this is a big environmental crisis that isn't getting enough attention, um, but hopefully you know, will, um, but the question is time um, and you know, making sure that we rise to this occasion and uh, move with sufficient speed, um, as Charlotte said. Um, one thing I hope everyone in the audience sees themselves as a role is an advocate and an amplifier for this conversation. Um, we need many more investors thinking about these issues. We need a lot of problem solvers working on these topics. And ultimately, we need to change the way that people think um, about the relationship between our economy and nature um, and to one that is nature positive. Uh, where the economy can actually help an, uh, an investment and help enhance our ecological systems on all around the world. So thank you all for joining us, um, and uh, I hope you continue to focus on these issues. Thanks, and take care.